Hi, Anne, and thank you for joining us. Hi, good morning from Seattle. <laughs> good, very early morning um, and evening and night for people from the other side of the world. Uh, so let yes, me- Yes, uh, good evening. So Anne, I, I will introduce you and uh, have a, an opening statement and then I'll dig in with a few questions. Uh, okay. That's okay with you. And again, thank sure. you. So hello everyone. And thank you for joining us today for this insightful discussion on measuring risk during times of uncertainty with Microsoft and Johnson. And Johnson is the corporate vice president of security, compliance and identity for business development at Microsoft, where she oversees the company's long-term investment and partnership strategies for these areas. And welcome, and it, it is great to have you with us. Uh, Thank you all, great to be here. And yeah, and we've been working over the past uh, year or so, and uh, you know, you're overseeing partnerships and it's an honor to be a partnership of yours. And thank you uh, for uh, you know, coming and sharing your thoughts. Um, I will kick off with a general statement uh, and then we will begin um, you know, uh, to give a context, an actual context. Uh, you know, when billions of people formed the largest remote workforce in history, literally overnight, the cybersecurity industry learned much more than how to just keep their data secure. They began leveraging AI and machine learning to streamline access to the data, whether it to be to their customers or employees. But uh, not any, everyone was ready financially, nor were they ready organizationally. This is only increase, increases risk to business continuity. Um, my first question to you, Anne, would be, how has the uncertainty of the pandemic forced us to change how we look at the business security? Yeah, so that's a great question. There's a couple of things, right? I mean, historically, security entities were focused on that, you know, inside the perimeter, firewall type defenses, all of your employees coming in either on a VPN or being within your environment. And one thing we learned quickly when you, we had, you know, millions of people literally going home overnight around the globe was that we had to balance productivity with security. So we had to actually have systems that allowed employees to get online, but not necessarily be choked through a VPN. And of course, they weren't on premise. So zero trust, I will tell you, a companies that had adopted a zero trust architecture, which, you know, in interrogates and inspects every transaction in the session, um, meaning that employees can work where they want and what devices they want. They can be VPN lists or have a split tunnel VPN. Those companies were the most successful at very quickly getting their employees to a place of productivity. I, I fully agree with that. But how, how do you look at the other companies that were not ready with this uh, you know, the risk and the depth of the risk that they expose themselves intentionally or intentionally, obviously. You know, they've quickly evolved. And one thing we saw during the, the pandemic is that, you know, ransomware attacks didn't become suddenly more mature. They were very familiar pieces of malware that they just had COVID lures, right? So as companies realized quickly that they had to adapt their systems to more remote work, while there was certainly a, a pretty significant rise in phishing type attacks, it was with very familiar types of malware that people were, you know, had been defending against for a period of time. So even the companies that were slower, right? And there are companies that were slower to, to move in the right way for employee productivity have found, you know, workarounds. You know, I, I talk a little bit about at Microsoft that we're, we're fairly privileged, right? We, we get issued a laptop, you know, from the company. It's all set up, it has all devices. We're already on, you know, multi-factor authentication and a um, split VPN in a zero trust environment. And that's the work that we did with our customers. And probably for the the first 90 to 120 days of the pandemic, we were working with our customers pretty much around the globe, around the clock to get them set up so that they could have productivity. And, you know, right now, you know, our studies tell us that still employers are going to keep, even, even when we all start going back to the office at some point next year, optimistically, right? They're still going to keep 40 to 50% of people at home. So these are not short-term investments they made. These are long-term investments they made. Absolutely. Uh, so let, let me take you, uh, you know, uh, we will revert back to this uh, pandemic uh, point, but cloud migration. Um, can you share with us, you know, the trends that you see around the enterprise cloud migration and yeah. that allows them to be more flexible and potentially secure? Sure. I think um, Sadi Nadella, our CEO, said it earlier this year. He said we had seen two years worth of digital transformation in two months. 
companies are modernizing their infrastructure and moving to the cloud at a much more rapid pace than they were. And that's really because they can serve applications and data and security to their employees remotely. The cloud is the best enabler of that because if you think about the elasticity and the scalability of the system and the ability to meet people where they're working, the cloud is the right tool. And then let's talk just for a minute about cloud security, right? Most of our customers tell us they are going to be in a multi-cloud environment. No matter how much I want them all to be on Azure, they're telling us that, no, we're going to have, you know, more than just Azure in our environment. So the security tooling that we're building and putting into place contemplates having an Azure environment, but it also contemplates getting threat signal and monitoring and system updates across a heterogeneous multi-cloud environment. And that's where the industry is headed. And that's where security companies are playing, I would say, a little bit of catch up, but they're getting there, right? Yes, let, let me ask you a trick question about that because yeah, the cloud migration is evident and it is the right uh, you know, movement of history. Uh, but do you think uh, some organizations uh, are moving too fast to the extent that they're not ready? And, or let me rephrase, how they can prepare themselves better for this cloud migration? You know, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I think the first thing that all companies should do, and I say this all the time, and it's even in the context of the cloud, is you need to be using something stronger than a username or a password because you are changing your risk perimeter, right? You're changing the perimeter of risk to identity. Once you go beyond the traditional firewalls and legacy protection systems, you actually need to think about what the perimeter is. And the perimeter becomes identity. And identity, the first part of identity is the person. And you need to get them away from using passwords because... 99% of credential thefts can be stopped by using multi-factor authentication. And we know that credential theft is a factor in 80 to 90% of breaches, right? That's the first thing. And that's probably the lowest lift for organizations is to just implement MFA for 100% of your employees 100% of the time. But the other things that organizations need to do to prepare is they need to have good monitoring. And you know that's something that your organization can help them with. For example, they need to have very good security analytics. They need to be able to see, you know, we see something like 8 trillion threats daily, globally, you know, potential threats, right? We see 8, eight trillion signals. Companies can't consume that. So they need to have really good machine learning engines, really good analytics, really good AI, and a lot of great automation too, because you want to automate them as much of those menial tasks as you can and save your humans for doing the really hard, complex tasks. So those are the types of things we talk to companies about as they're putting their infrastructure in place. And of course, you can't forget, you know, things like having great anti-phishing, you know, uh, technology, and also doing a lot of employee education. It has to be hand in hand. You have to be doing the education while making the systems more secure. So as you said, uh, a quick win, it, it can cover potentially over 90% of the, the attacks can be you know, um, um, the multi-factor authentication and, and easier moves. But let's look at the, the, the rest of, of it that are not protected. And this is where I believe uh, your organization comes in with the Azure security stack. And I would like to deep dive a little bit on that um, what is, what is driving uh, your organization, the Azure security stack? Um, how can those uh, you know, layers, you mentioned analytics and uh, machine learning and other capabilities that are residing in the stack and, and more and more products that are coming in, um, how can you frame uh, Microsoft around that? Yeah, so I'm gonna put it in three buckets for you. I wanna talk about Azure baseline security. So the core security around the Azure infrastructure. I want to talk a little bit about um, Azure monitoring, and then I'll talk a little bit just about um, Azure Network Service, Azure Network Security. So from a baseline standpoint, your expectation with an Azure, remember, it's a shared responsibility. It's one thing I always want to say, going to the cloud doesn't become a security panacea. It actually is a shared responsibility. So we're going to provide you, you know, HSMs. We're going to provide you technologies for holding your own key, bringing your own key, confidential computing, private computing, containerization, all of those things. What the customer needs to bring to us is their policies and their controls around data so we can apply, help them apply the right labeling around that and the right encryption standards around that. So there's that part of the Azure security. The second piece of Azure security is Azure network security. Our customers are taking advantage of our capabilities within you know, SD-WAN and within DDoS protection and within web application firewalls that are actually all built into the Azure platform as the Azure network services. And the third thing then is all of the monitoring capabilities. So if you think about Azure Security Center, um, Azure Security Center actually gives you the health of your Azure security footprint. And by the way, any 
fully integrated third party and it's heterogeneous and multi-cloud. So it gives you the health of the environment, but in addition to giving you the healthy environment, it gives you the top 10, 20, 30 recommendations for improving the security healthier environment. To me, that's the more powerful part about it. Um, you have um, Azure Sentinel, something we work with uh, Cyberproof on. First cloud native SIM in the market, um, born in the cloud, built in the cloud. Um, we're very proud of Sentinel. It went generally available um, in November of last year. We already have thousands of customers taking advantage of Azure Sentinel. And it truly is a comprehensive analytics platform that takes in all of the threat signal, whether it's generated within your Microsoft estate or outside of your Microsoft estate, and may, allows you to take action with the capabilities we have with Azure Monitor, the SOAR capabilities we have, and then the partnerships we have with companies like Cyberproof to make it real and operationalize it for customers. That combined with our CASB solutions, you know, our, our cloud um, solutions are very, very robust. But the, the other thing I want to emphasize, because I don't think people realize this, because we, you know, as an organization, of course, we brand everything as Azure, but all of those solutions are cross cloud. So they're multi cloud. So if you have Salesforce or Box or AWS or whatever environments you have, we're not just protecting your Azure estate, we're protecting your heterogeneous estate. And that's one thing that I think companies, as they reduce tools, because they have to reduce complexity in their environment or they're never going to get ahead of security, as they reduce complexity to challenge us and to look to us to be that solution provider that gets beyond the Microsoft state. We're there today. And it's one thing that I don't think we probably as a company talk about enough. You mentioned in your thorough answer uh, partnerships and you're overseeing partnerships uh, uh, in Microsoft. Um, when you're talking about it, we are a partner and we're very happy to be, uh, but uh, what are you looking in partners uh, when you, you know, uh, screen and qualify and look for the strategic uh, you know, uh, shift that will enable your products or Microsoft to go forward with the strategy? The first thing we look for is to be customer obsessed. We have a culture of being customer obsessed. So we wanna go jointly to our customers with solutions that make them more successful, that reduce the complexity in their environment, that simplify their environment and their security system so they can really focus on getting the work done. So that's the first thing is that cultural ethos of being really customer obsessed. The second thing is strategic alignment, right? Do, is the partner strategically aligned to our portfolio? There's spaces of security we don't necessarily play in today. So if the partner's core competency is in that space, are they building a new practice? Depends. The third thing, because I also oversee our security, what we call our ISV relationships, so our independent software vendors, things like you know the Qualysis of the world or the, the third parties where we don't have an end-to-end -end suite. One thing we look there, again, is strategic alignment. Are they filling a gap that our customer needs? And can we get them integrated into our solutions? Can we get them integrated into Azure Sentinel? Can we get them integrated into Azure Security Center to the benefit of our customers? But I will tell you, everything we look at starts with the problem we're trying to solve, a real problem we're trying solve for customers and weaving together and tying together those partnerships to be more effective in solving that problem. So a follow-up question on that, um, specifically with MSSP, such as Cyberproof. Uh, so you mentioned, you know, the general uh, criteria. Um, you mentioned earlier the fact that we can leverage um, and take deeper into the monitoring area, um, Sentinel, uh, for example, but other uh, stack uh, uh, products. What else uh, do you see, are you looking for uh, in MSSP's partners? Managed detection of response. It's a huge need and a huge opportunity in the industry, right? Think about the proliferation of endpoints, whether it be mobile devices, laptops, or IoT devices. All of our customers are asking us to provide better capabilities for threat hunting and for remediation and automation from a managed defense standpoint. So if you're talking about pure technology stack, one of the things that we work a lot with our partners is that managed defense. The other thing is uh, modernizing the SOC. And that's something that we're really strong with Cyberproof in doing, as you know, we're working with several customers to modernize their SOC operations, to simplify their SOC operations, to make to improve the efficacy of the SOC operations and to reduce burnout and, and what I call boredom. Um, you find that SOC admins are either burned out or they're bored because you know they're like fire, they're like firefighters, right? They're going to the firehouse and some days there's nothing going on, and other days they're working 24 hours just to solve one problem. So that operationalizing and modernizing and simplifying the SOC is an incredibly important part of our story and with our partners. Yeah, I fully agree with that. And <laughs> uh, we're trying to do that together, as you know. Um, 
I, I want to, you know, you mentioned uh, um, some uh, geopolitical uh, metaphors. Uh, coming back, I don't know if you've seen a, a, a former Mossad director uh, um, keynote uh, previously, Tamir Pardos, uh, but he spoke a lot about, uh, you know, the state level, um, uh, state nation attacks. Um, from your perspective, how do you see that today as a risk? I mean, it's a very actual question because we, see, we saw that just last week, the report coming from the American Intel uh, agencies about the adversaries coming into the 2020 campaign. Um, any thoughts on the environment we're in today? Yeah, the environment we're in today is, is, is tense, right? I mean, you're, you're so, so I'll talk about the election for just a second, but then I want to move to the broader topic. Look, there's all kinds of actors within the U.S. election right now that are either spreading disinformation, which is part of that campaign that you, you saw last week, or they're actually, you know, trying to penetrate the, the um, systems, trying to penetrate the infrastructure. The one thing that's important for, you know, America and for Americans is to make sure that you're confident in the safety and security of your vote, right? Um, and that's one thing that I think that CISA, um, you know, Director Krebs organization has done a really good job with is, is getting ahead of those threats, making sure the public is educated. They've, they've been on a really robust, you know, education campaign. It started with, I don't know if you saw the, probably a year and a half, two years ago, they did the pineapple pizza campaign just to get people's attention and then did some messaging around that using multi-factor authentication, understanding disinformation. I mean, those things will continue. And by the way, those aren't new threats. It's just the internet makes them a lot easier to spread, right? And they can spread a lot faster. We've seen disinformation in elections, you know, since the beginning of time. Um, we could have some historical conversations about Rome and some historical conversations about our societies, but disinformation is, is pretty common. Common. Um, but as far as nation state attacks, you know, we generally know who the actors are. We generally know who their targets are. We even to a large extent know who their tools are. We know who their motives are. Um, they are very sophisticated. They are tremendously well funded. They are very agile. They navigate very quickly. But at the end of the day, they're, they don't worry some of us in the cyber industry as much as cyber criminals. And I'll tell you why. Cyber criminals, um, you know, ransomware act, most, by the way, I'm not going to say most because somebody will, will challenge that. A lot of ransomware is perpetrated by cyber criminals. And it's purely, you know, a smash and grab robbery, bank robbing um, from individuals or corporations, um, you know, a means of getting money. But the one thing we've seen cyber criminals do is as we've watched nation states outsource they're outsourcing their attacks to cybercrime gangs because they can be one step removed and have plausible deniability. We're seeing the cyber criminals then will take a, say, take a contract from a nation state actor to get into an environment. And while they're in the environment, they're gonna launch some ransomware. So they're monetizing the attack twice, right? We see cybercrime gangs that specialize in, we're just gonna get access and we're gonna sell that access. So cybercrime gangs to me are much less predictable. They, um, they also have, are pretty modern in their toolkits. We've seen nation states, you know, monetizing their legacy toolkits on the web. And um, anyone can buy those, you know, $500, you can buy the la last rev of the, you know, attack that a certain actor used. And then anyone can use that to launch whatever type of attack. And if you look at just some of the bigger attacks we've had in recent histories, um, some of those just were not as planned to be as large as they ended up being necessarily. So, and I, there, there is a notion in your question that I would like to briefly touch, if I may. Uh, it seems like uh, you see uh, your organization um, not accountable, but rather uh, with some sort of a nation level responsibility, although you're not a cybersecurity agency. There are many, many others in the States protecting, uh, you know, um, uh, the pre premise of, of the US democracy. But still, how do you see the role of uh, corporations such as Microsoft, but not only Microsoft, in facing this kind of national threats. Yeah, so so we believe we have a responsibility and, and Brad Smith is, says it much more eloquently than I do, but we have a responsibility to provide our war fighters, whether they be physical war fighters or cyber war fighters with the, with the absolute latest state of the art, best tools to fight those, to fight those battles, um, whether that's in the U S or whether that's not, you know, with uh, other countries that we, we do business with the government. And we believe we have a responsibility and a mission to do threat intelligence sharing, a responsibility and a mission to do education and a responsibility and a mission to provide them with the tools they need to be, you know, to fight these battles. I love your answer. And uh, 
well, we covered a lot of topics in only 20 minutes. So uh, we have, uh, I have more questions, but I get some questions from the audience that I would like to uh, screen and share with you. So I have a first one, uh, if, if that's okay with you. Sure. And I'm reading it. Emerging technologies, especially uh, deep fakes and 5G advanced cyber threats. What would be the recommended defense strategy against these advanced cyber threats? Yeah, so let me, I'm going to put those in two very different buckets. Um, I'll start with 5G. Look, the biggest threat to, from 5G in our environment, and I'm not going to get into the geopolitical conversation around 5G, I just want to talk about the technology. The biggest threat to 5G in our environment is actually um, a latency threat. Your, your bad actors are going to have a lot more latency to very, much more quickly launch attacks in your environment. And my biggest concern about 5G is IoT and OT devices, because as you see the proliferation devices to modernize cities, right? And that is coming, right? To um, guarantee clean water supplies, because we, there's a lot we can do now with AI and machine learning. And then you get to add the latency of 5G and the breadth of 5G. There becomes a big concern about how large and how fast an attack can go. So the controls there are, believe it or not, because I, you know, the Microsoft's detection and response team, our incident response team for customers, that's the customer facing incident response team, will tell you that they still 80 to 90% of breaches still happen because of what we call, you know, cyber resilience practices. Companies aren't using multi-factor authentication. They aren't patched. And when I say that, I want to be clear. Devices, not everything can be patched. It starts with inventory control and knowing what devices you have and being able to quarantine the devices that can't be patched, patch those that can be patched very quickly. But we find unpatched devices. We find too much privilege at the endpoint. I, you know, as a user, as an average user, which I am, I don't need admin rights on my laptop. Microsoft puts whatever applications I need on it, right? We find a tremendous amount of admin rights, you know, at the laptop level, which allows for fast lateral movement. We find insecure domain servers, you know, the shared username, password, no multi-factor authentication. So my answer to that question about 5G and the threats of IoT, et cetera, is you have to do all the fundamentals first. And then you have to do you know, time to detection. That is the most important thing. You have to reduce your time to detection so you can respond. And the only way you can do that is with machine learning, artificial intelligence, and automation. You have to automate as much as possible. Um, so that, that's you know, the 5G on deep fakes, completely different topic. Um, deepfakes are worrisome, right? They're super worrisome. They're the next generation of disinformation. Um, there was the, you know, the famous one about the, um, the, the CEO of the company and it, you know, it potentially caused a large stock sell off and they had to stop trading the shares. Um, they're something that, you know, as we get into these large disinformation campaigns, here's what I would say. They're still relatively expensive. They're not a technology that's broad-based, but they will be. And we've seen how effective lower tech disinformation campaigns are. So I know the impact of deepfakes is gonna be quite high. That, that means that we need to have really great technology that very quickly detects them, but it's not just technology. We also need to have um, really, uh, what's the word I want? I don't wanna say ethical, cause that's too strong of a word, but we need to have a lot of self, and I'm going to say self-regulation by media organizations, by social media organizations that actually detect, they have to invest, right? And they have to be willing to not share that deep fake, no matter what kind of pressure they're getting to share it. Um, and we need to do a lot of education of our citizens globally, not just, you know, we, we've seen, like I said, the effects of disinformation. U.S. elections is a great example of it. We have to continually educate and we have to educate in simple ways, by the way. You can't expect somebody who isn't a technologist. I'm a 30 year technologist, right? But when I'm talking to my family who, you know, barely can use their computer to do email, my language has to be a whole lot different than what I'm talking to my peers. And that's something you need to understand is you need to put this, these, really complex constructs into abstract concepts that people can understand and relate to their day-to-day -day lives. And, you know, I'll give you one example. When I talk to about multi-factor authentication with people, the majority of folks that I'm talking to at least have a smartphone, right? I say, okay, how do you log into your smartphone? Well, I look at it or I touch it. I said, that's multi-factor authentication. Oh, okay. The light bulb kind of goes on. And that's that, you know, that whole deep fake thing has to be a combination of technology to detect it, the will of social media and media organizations not to promote it and to have their own detection tools and a whole lot of education on, on for citizens about it. So on, specifically on that, you're talking about education, uh, smart education or efficient education, uh, but do you see a role for, and Tamir Pardo, the, um, the, the previous uh, keynoter, he mentioned that uh, 
responsibility of the, you know, the government or even the international community uh, through treaties and, and other means, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it regulation, but rather uh, um, trust being built between communities and nations. Do you see them part of that uh, endeavor? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I quote Brad Smith a lot because he's one of my favorite people, but, um, and he's so on the leading edge of this. He still talks about how we're governing 2020 technology with typewriter laws. For, we both need to have the right regulatory environment, right? But also that international cooperation, that that public public sector coordination between governments, the private public sector coordination, the private private um, coordination. It, it just has to happen because things don't happen in a vacuum. You don't get a threat in the U.S. and then never see it again in any part of the world. You don't get a threat in the U.K. and never see it in any part of the world. We have to be, and we, you know, the the. Um, I think you're familiar with the five eyes, right? The five, you know, U US government partners very closely with, with those countries, but we also partner beyond that. And we have to continue that. That has to be the ethos of the, of the governments to actually want to cooperate with each other. You mentioned earlier uh, when you answered about the 5G, uh, the IoT challenge, you know, uh, and, and again, uh, Tamir mentioned uh, an, a very good example. I think it was yesterday that Tesla embarked their uh, almost full autonomous uh, car and breaking into a car and, you know, the future car, et cetera. Uh, how do you see uh, Microsoft facing those challenges? I mean, you touched that, but it's a very... Uh, relevant question because only I don't know, a few months ago uh, Microsoft acquired the company in Israel that might apply to some of those challenges. What is what is what are you doing uh, as part of Microsoft in approaching those five-year going forward challenges in IoT? Yeah, let me talk a little about today and then I'll talk a little bit about the future. So we did purchase CyberX because we wanted um, more OT um, coverage and that's what they were really strong at. So if you think about IoT and OT, we have the Azure IoT security framework. That's where all the signal comes in, right? And we, and by the way, IoT devices like every other device should behave in an expected manner. It's a behavioral conversation. Even if you've never seen the device or the class of device, there's still an expected behavior depending on what the use of the device is. So a cardio, like a device in a car cardiac lab, even if it's a brand new device or it's a different class of device, is still going to behave in a similar way. So that's what that Azure IoT layer is able to detect. And we're fully integrating um, CyberX into that, but also fully integrating both of those things with Sentinel. So you can actually take all of those signals and compare them with all the other signal in your environment. So that's for what I call brownfield IoT devices, things that are already out there and existing brownfield OT devices. We also announced last year, might've been two years ago, but it doesn't matter, it's GA now, Azure Sphere at the RSA conference. It's a fully hardened Linux um, operating uh, on top of a chip, OS on top of a chip for building new IoT devices because legacy IoT devices weren't built contemplating security. They just weren't. You have them all over your home, by the way. I, I constantly have this um, ongoing conversation with my other half because he would like to bring the entire house online and I won't even allow a listening device in the house. So <laughs> we found a compromise in a couple places, but I am just totally, I'd be completely offline at home if I could, honestly, because I don't think the IoT security is there yet, even though I'm on a subnet and VPN and I have all kinds of security, right? Which makes the family crazy, as you can imagine. But, um, but beyond that, I think that we're, we need to contemplate both those brownfield devices with Azure IoT, and then you have Azure Sphere for building new devices. The other thing, and Tesla's a great example, because I don't know if you saw, I published a blog with Ram Shankar last week about um, adversarial machine learning and adversarial AI, and that we work with MITRE on an attack grid and an attack framework for adversarial ML and AI. One of the things that Tesla is dealing with right now, or not just Tesla, but automated cars are dealing with right now, is actually large attacks. So not just, not hacking into the car. Think, Forget about hacking into the car. That's actually the hard way to attack, to attack an autonomous vehicle. The easier way to attack an autonomous vehicle is if you're driving down the 405 in, in California and a billboard flashes something, the car picks it up in one to two seconds and will take action. Think about having thousands of cars do that simultaneously and it's a it's a malicious attack. That is the thing that the, the, the mobilized of the world and all of the people that develop the technology are thinking about those adversarial machine learning, adversarial AI, and how to reduce those type of wholesale attacks. Very interesting, and uh, yes, I, we will uh, publish, uh, re republish, uh, repost your uh, your blog. Uh, sounds very interesting. I, I got another uh, question from the audience. I think you touched uh, some of that, and it relates to you know the your future. We want you want also just the future uh, as you see it. Uh, so I, I'm reading another question from the audience. Uh, digital transformation is such a buzzword, but the process of moving to the cloud is happening faster now. The frequently 
this frequency creates more problems for the short term. How do you avoid losing efficiency and speed while going through these types of long-term changes? Yeah, so that, that's, that's a really great question. And I think that, you know, the one thing, just like everything else, is you, you have to plan. And I, I don't mean to sound um, I don't mean to sound really basic, right? But you, let's say you're moving from, you know, um, exchange on-premise, you know, exchange on-premise environment, and you're going to move to Office 365, right, in the cloud. Um, you don't want to lose that user productivity um, during that process. So you really have to sit down and understand what the migration path is. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a plug there, Yuval. Have, being, you know, having a partner that's going to come in and work with you on both the architecture, but also the migration process, because you, what you don't want to do is flip the switch and find out that you've disenfranchised 30% of your users, right? So having someone that actually is sitting beside you and that planning is the most important part of that before you ever flip a switch making sure you've planned making sure you've tested making sure you have a rollback plan too by the way um, if things don't go well so you're not caught um, in a situation it's the same thing if you allow me for a second with a cyber attack right if you have a cyber attack that takes out your systems what is your cyber resiliency plan what is the plan to get your business operations back online while you do the forensics work and bring systems back online? You can't be fully dependent on just one set of systems. Is it, you know, do you have a plan to, um, I'll use the Maersk example, they couldn't move ships even via paper any longer. They had no policy to do that. So when they had their outage, they actually had to subcontract some of their freight to one of their competitors. You don't want to be in that situation. So both things, a plan to move to the crowd requires a plan, including a rollback plan, and from a cyber resilience standpoint, very similar type plan. How are you going to bring systems back online? How are you going to maintain core business operations? All of that requires not just technology. We always think technology is going to solve every problem. You actually have to do the roll up your sleeves hard work of doing the planning of how you're going to implement the technology. Okay, so I'll take it forward and ask about, you know, five years from now, or I don't know, even more. How do you see uh, the roadmap of challenges or risks. Uh, I mean, you touched that, but maybe you can frame it uh, from a Microsoft uh, visionary perspective. Sure. So the things I think about every day, since I'm thinking about long-term strategy, typically, I think about 5G, by the way. Um, I think about adversarial machine learning and adversarial artificial intelligence, and that's data poisoning, model poisoning, etc. cetera. Um, I think about quantum computing and the, the opportunity and the advantages we're going to have from quantum computing in terms of cyber, but also the risk right? Again, latency, speed, quantum, you know, quantum breaking encryption. Are we going to get those encryption algorithms deployed quickly enough? They exist, but our company is actually going to update quickly enough so that when quantum does become real, um, those are the types of things I think about. I think about the, um, the increase in nation state and cybercrime attacks. Ransomware is, you know, ransomware. Somebody though gave me an optimistic statement. I want to give this to your audience. They said, look, you know, five years ago, whatever, it was DDoS attacks. Everybody was having a DDoS attack and couldn't you know, get their systems online. We figured that out. Yeah, there are occasionally, we're gonna figure out ransomware, but it's gonna be really painful until we do, right? The, we're gonna get better at detecting it or responding to it, um, but it's gonna be really painful until we do. And I don't think it's gonna be tomorrow that we figure that out. I, th I think that's still gonna be kind of baked in the pie a few years from now. And then you talked about it. Uh, one of the thing, one of the greatest threats I think to cybersecurity as a community is this increasing trend we're seeing towards nationalism on a global basis and the lack of sharing. I think we really, really, regardless of what the political environment is within a country, I still think we have got to be doing really robust threat sharing um, on a cybersecurity level. So those are the types of things that I'm thinking about in the next few years. Thank you for that. Uh, we don't have much time, but I have another question from the audience. Actually, it's not an audience, it's a runner or a CTO whom you met uh, at least yeah. a few times. Uh, so here is a question from Iran or CTO. As part of Microsoft's security concept, does Microsoft also see critical infrastructure such as utilities, substations, power plants, et cetera, connecting to the cloud? And if so, how it should be handled? Yeah. So. Well, wow, that's a tough one around. So um, that goes back to that IoT, OT question. The answer is yes, um, but it depends, right? We're not seeing, there are some, you know, there's some downstream operations that aren't necessarily, um, that haven't necessarily moved to the cloud yet where a lot of upstream up operations, if you think about just oil and gas have, we see a tremendous amount of cloud connectivity for energy providers, you know, ut utilities, right? Um, and critical infrastructure. And there's nothing really different um, that you need to do from a, from a cloud security 
security standpoint that you wouldn't do for any other organization other than have a really robust program around IoT and OT, security, detection, response. Again, making sure if there is an attack, you can bring those systems back online very, very quickly. Obviously, you're delivering critical infrastructure to citizens, right? It becomes a much different type of threat um, than it is. But um, we also know that bad actors have targeted and potentially are, are, are embedded in some of those environments that's, that's known to the industry, right? So that time to detection, that being able to actually um, put those bad actors in an environment where they minimize their harm before you can evict them, right? Contain them and then evict them. And evict you know, we had an eviction that took, by the way, it wasn't in critical infrastructure, but in a customer it took five years, but we were able to contain them during that period of time and minimize the damage that they were causing. And so they, they were in so they were pervasive in so many parts of a global organization. So that detection and containment of the bad actors is really important because eviction doesn't always happen overnight. We thank you. We have in our audience, uh, I would say two groups. We have seasoned CISOs, and young professionals. And so mm -hmm. I would like to represent them and ask a question for each. Um, let's start with the CISOs. Um, the security spend depends on the approval of the board. What, their board, what would you highlight in representing a request for a greater budget or allocation of resources? I'm sorry, Eval, you broke up a little. I heard the security spend is approved by the board. I didn't hear the rest. What would you, I hope you can hear me now smoothly. Yes. What, how would you, um, what would you recommend to those CISOs approaching the board for, to highlight while asking for resources or budget, et cetera? Security is so hard because you're proving a negative, right? If you haven't had an event, getting the eyes of the board and the attention of the board, it's kind of like buying insurance, right? You're saying, you know, help us protect against something happening in the future. The most effective CISOs I've seen um, go to the board, here are my, you know, here's the hundred things we need to work on. Here's the five things we must work on today. And then they give peer stories, right? Here's a peer that was, you know, unfortunately had an event. Unfortunately, you have to educate the board. And a lot of that, you know, you want to do it in the most positive way, but you have to use examples of we can't let this happen to us because here's the monetary loss, the reputation loss, the damage to an organization that's similar to ours that it happened to. But the best advice I can give you, because I've sat and watched some CISOs, you know, present to the board and been involved with some of their, the constructs of their presentations. The best advice I can give you is that you really make the message simple, understand they're not technologists necessarily, and, they're, and a lot of them certainly aren't security professionals, um, and highlight the top five things. And again, put it in really tangible terms that they can consume that impact their day-to-day -day life, and you're going to be much more effective. Thank you. I will adopt that as, a, as an NDR MSSP as well. I think it, uh, it, it is relevant uh, to the, that group as well. Now, representing the other group, the young professionals, um, what would you um, suggest to a professional technologist or not necessarily in the cybersecurity realm, starting his career, first steps, you know, how should he plan, you know, from a highlight guideline that you can uh, provide? What, what do you think? Yeah, so cybersecurity is like this huge field, right? There's, I don't know, at this point in time, there's, you know, 50, 60 more or more categories that Gartner covers, right? So it's this huge field. So if you're starting in cybersecurity, my first encouragement is, with you is don't just get yourself into, I'm going to be an X and that's the only thing I'm going to do, whether it's, you know, a reverse engineer or code or whatever it is, right? Explore. Go get experiences, take training courses in all the different things that interest you before you decide what a specialty is. Because you have, you know, we need help everywhere and you have a few years. That's the first thing I'd suggest. SANS offers great training. ISC2 offers great training. Take some of those courses. Take your employer's courses. A lot of employers offer courses, right? Take college courses. I, I'm shocked at how many colleges and universities globally now have cybersecurity curriculum as part of their regular track. And find out what really interests you. The second thing, and I'm trying to future-proof your career here is data science. Learn data science. Machine learning and AI are now, are going to become a huge part of cybersecurity. They're already a big part. They're going to become a huge part. You need to be a data scientist to a certain extent to actually, even if you don't actually aren't the one that develops models, you need to understand how it works. Um, so invest some time in understanding data science. Invest some time in understanding machine learning. Invest time in understanding models, algorithms, um, 
statistics. Um, I have a statistics theory. I think it's super useful, by the way. Um, so, you know, invest some time in doing those things that are going to actually further your career. But the best advice I can give you is really take that, you know, opportunity the first three to five to seven years of a career to explore, to figure out what's interesting to you, to make sure you have a broad base of skills, because the one thing is this industry is always changing. You could be the best ex specialist in five years now, nobody needs that specialist. So make sure you're keep continuing to update your skills. Yeah, to a strong foundation and keep it uh, up to date all the time. So, uh, and I have only one last question. I mean, I have many more, but we've been uh, hearing uh, great insights from you over the past uh, um, hour or so. Um, my last question to you is, are you optimistic or pessimistic looking at the future? Uh, what, what does the future look like? Uh, you know, uh, cybersecurity wise, but you know, we have broadened uh, the, the discussion to other areas as well. So share with us your uh, thoughts. I'm always optimistic about it because for every big thing you see in the news, there's thousands we've had, you don't see in the news because we stop them. That's the one thing you have to keep in your mind. This is a hard job. It can be really incredibly demoralizing. I read an article over the weekend that was really, really hard on the industry. And we need to take that as learnings, by the way. There are things we haven't done well, right? The proliferation of tooling is one of them. You have a problem, you buy a new tool. That's not an effective way to run any kind of program, by the way. Um, but I'm optimistic because I know that we're doing really great work today. And yeah, occasionally something's going to get by us. And I know with the people we're bringing into the industry, remember, security is still a fairly nascent industry. Cybersecurity is still a nascent industry. We're bringing in new and robust talent every day that thinks differently, that looks at problems differently. I've been doing this for 20 years. I need people on a daily basis to challenge me, that challenge those big thoughts that I have, right? Those assumptions that I have that say, no, no, let's look at this differently. And that's why I'm optimistic because you have some great minds trying to solve some hard problems. And we're all, you know, people who do cybersecurity are very purpose-driven and very mission-driven and we continue to be so. Great. Thank you, Anne. I, I would only, you know, as a conclusion, I would say that, uh, you know, cyber uh, is originated in Greek, meaning uh, somewhat leadership. I think that the cybersecurity questions are related directly, as we've seen over the past 45 minutes, to, uh, you know, uh, big questions, big challenges. And I think we've covered some of them uh, in our fireside chat. Uh, I wish to thank you for your time and insights. And, um, and uh, I'm handing it over to you, Howard, to explain what is next on our summit. Thank you, Yuval. Have a good evening. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks.